Good morning. I don't know if I can do this today. I'm pretty nervous because I got my family here. It's easy to preach to y'all because you don't know me. But they know me really well. Uh, they've seen the best of me and the worst of me. You know how that feels? So I just want to introduce them to you. That's uh, the lady I married there on the far right, Dana. And then back on this side is my oldest son, David, and his wife, Sarah. Is that right, David, Sarah? And then in the middle is Montana and his newly proposed to fiancé from Dimebox, Texas, Hannah. There you go. Loosen things up a little bit at this Church of Christ. Have a little clapping while we're going on. And then Zachary is my oldest grandson, and sitting next to him is his wife since August, Miriam. So there they are. That's a... Oh, and then we have a visitor. What was his name? Alex. What? I can't hear that. <laughs> anyway, he's visiting with us. We had breakfast with him yesterday. Uh, he belongs to another family, and David and Sarah are babysitting him or young man sitting him for a few days. So I wanted to uh, take a minute and introduce part of my uh, family to you. So the last couple of three, well, the last three Sundays, we been talking about this tension that exists between us and God. It, you know, when we sing these songs and hear the scripture readings relative to communion that we heard this morning and relative to giving, there's always a tension that exists between what God expects of us and what we actually do. That's why when I stand before my family, I realize that they have all these memories running through their heads of things that I've done, both good and bad. And that's a natural tension. And it happened to, first to Adam and Eve in the garden when God uh, made the world and he gave them everything that they needed in the world. He gave them each other as husband and wife. He told them to multiply and fill the earth. So all of us are relatives of Adam and Eve, long descended but relatives of Adam and Eve from the first man and the first woman that God made. He gave them things of value in the garden. There was gold and aromatic resin, and so that would later turn into um, monetary things of value that we would use in exchange for goods. God knew that we would need that kind of thing. He made the world as it's described in uh, Genesis, uh, pleasing to the eye. As they looked at the garden, it was pleasing to the eye and, and good for food. And so God expected us to enjoy it. Dan and I always uh, enjoy when we come down here, the drive from uh, Navasota to uh, Brenham, because it's such a beautiful piece of land and the farmland in there with the houses sitting up in the trees. and. God expected us to enjoy all of those things. But the real issue of life wasn't having children and in enjoying good food and enjoying good scenery. The real issue of life was, God said, I've put two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's an, it's a, it's an important and interesting note that God, knows, God knew about evil before he made the world. If you look into the creation, God not only created man and woman, but before he created man and woman, he created angelic beings. And according to Jude, those angelic beings had the same choice that you and I have, whether or not we will honor God. And so all of that was all... all already in process when he made the world 
And the reason he put two trees in the garden was so because his intention was that, as we saw last week, that when he created the world, that man would man and woman would reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And so therein lies the tension between us and God. The tension of Adam and Eve when God told them, don't eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, because if you eat of it, you will die. I don't even know if they knew what death was. I suppose they thought in their minds, well, if we're living and because they had never experienced death, they would have simply, well, it's the opposite of what I'm doing now. I don't know what they thought death was. And this is where God's word comes in. God's word comes in to relieve us of this tension between us and himself. And so the first time it happened, of course, was with Adam and Eve. The second time it happened is with Cain and Abel. Cain was a uh, farmer, and Abel was a shepherd. Um, After Adam and Eve left the garden, God apparently had given them directions on how they were supposed to worship him because they knew about offerings. And so Cain and Abel brought their offerings to the Lord. Cain brought an offering from the soil, and Abel brought an offering from the flock. And one of the offerings wasn't pleasing to God. You say, well, that seems kind of arbitrary. Well, with, with God, things are arbitrary. He has reasons, but he decides what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And so Cain and Abel felt that same tension. And when they came, they made their offerings. And Cain and Abel both offered their sacrifices to God. And obviously, as I said before, God had explained to them what was acceptable and what wasn't. And so God said that one of the offerings was acceptable and one wasn't. And that created jealousy on Cain's part. And there's a passage in chapter 4 and verse 6 where God says to Cain, then the Lord said to Cain, and notice the tension that exists here between the Lord and Cain and Cain and the Lord. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, and here's the, all this is interesting, but here's the real interesting part to me. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. And you must rule over it. And Cain had to make a decision. What am I going to do? What am I going to do that I'm sad, face downcast, that my sacrifice wasn't acceptable? And what am I going to do about this anger in me? How am I going to handle that? And that's as personal as this tension between us and God gets, because all of us face this one way or another. Right? We all have it. Several times a day. We have to decide, what am I going to do? I have this desire. I have these feelings. I have these reactions to the things that happen around me. And if we know anything about God at all, they stand in juxtaposition to what we want and what we desire. Now, the good news is that we have God's word. And that, that in and of itself is an amazing thing. Um, several years ago, we had a men's... Now, if I lose my train of thought on this illustration, uh, you, and I'll tell you, because I, I do that sometimes. I've done it. It's not because of some disease I have. It's just mentally incapable from time to time. 
So if I lose my train of thought, you tell me that, uh, you know, I was, I see and I've already forgot what I was going to tell you to remind me to talk about if I forgot what I ended up talking about. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to, uh, my dad wrote me a letter several years ago. I was going to make pancakes for about 40 men down in Nederland, Texas for a men's retreat that we had. And he writes me this letter about how to make pancakes. And dad was known, well known for his buttermilk pancakes. And so he writes down the recipe. And then he says at the end, now son, I still have this letter. I have several letters from my dad that I'll share with you as time goes on because it shows you how goofy my dad was actually. He, he, uh, he, I mean, he's a great guy, but he's a little like him, so. He writes me this letter, he tells me how to make pancakes, and he says, now, son, you cannot be successful making pancakes in Tupperware. <laughs> now, listen to this part. Then he says, first, make your pancakes in a stainless steel pan. When you get ready to transport them to where you're going to cook them, you can put them in Tupperware to transport them but you can't mix them in the Tupperware. Now see, that's a, it, that Ill, now is my, this is where you remind me what I was talking about, but I actually remember. That was my dad's word to me, and I saved the letter because it meant something to me. I have letters when my mama first got Alzheimer's. She used to send us kids little postcards just about every week. You know those self-stamped ones that you can buy? You, you just write on the back and put an address and put it in the mail. And I have a whole bunch of those that my mama wrote. As time went on, the notes on those postcards made less and less and less and less sense. And the last one she sent, I have no idea how it got to my house. The address was barely legible. And on the back, she put four E. And there was a little scribbling. And then she put love, mom. Why did I keep that letter about pancakes and that ridiculous thing about Tupperware and stainless steel? Why did I keep the letters of my mom? Because they were from my mom and my dad. Do you know what we hold in our hand? It's, it's an amazing thing when you think about it. The invisible God that we've never seen. This ha, ha, that, who has the power to say, let there be light. Before there was sunshine. And the light comes on. The God who can take a handful of dirt and run it through his fingers and a human being comes out, a breathing adult human being and who can put that man to sleep and take out a rib and from that make a woman. And we hold his words to us in our hands. This is God's word. Can, I don't, can hardly fathom how significant that is. That I have a letter from God, like a letter from my dad, like a letter from my mom. The God in heaven who made me wrote me a note. And he says, if you'll, if you'll read my letter... Sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. But you can master it if you'll read my letter. Actually, I mixed those pancakes in stainless steel and transported them in Tupperware in honor of my dad. This is God's word. In Mark chapter 4, the crowds had followed Jesus wherever he went. Mark, Mark is, 
is clear in how he sets up his book. In chapters 1 through 3, if you read those first three chapters of Mark, every time he went somewhere, the crowd was there. You remember the, with the house when the people were there? And there, the guy, had, some friends brought their paralytic friend to get healed. Why did they have to let him down through the roof? Well, because everyone was there. If Jesus were here today doing what Jesus did then, what do you think would be on Facebook? What do you think Donald Trump would be tweeting? So the crowd followed Jesus everywhere, and in Mark chapter 4, the crowd has gathered around the Sea of Galilee, and there's so many people there that Jesus has to step out into the water, into a boat, to speak to them. And he t the Bible says, and I like this because the Bible says he, not that I don't like other parts of the Bible, but Jesus turns to the crowd and he looks at him and he says, if you have ears, I want you to hear me. And then he talks about their hearts. And he talks about the kind of heart that they have. Because Jesus didn't come here to heal the sick, even though he did heal the sick. If Jesus came here just to heal the sick, I mean, his sojourn on earth could have lasted five minutes. After he had received the baptism by John the Baptist and his ministry begun, he, Jesus could have waved his hand like God did at creation and say, let all the sick be well, couldn't have he? Why didn't he? Because his point wasn't for... <coughs> His point wasn't for you and me to be healthy. His point was for you and me to hear God through him because John chapter 1 and verse 1, Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And God has spoken to us. There's a man that writes books about churches. He preaches for a non-denominational church in California. His name is Francis Chan. And he, said, he put something on Facebook last week. He has some great uh, writing, by the way. Anyway, he, he put this uh, statement on Facebook. He said, now listen to this. If you haven't listened to anything else except for the pancake story, listen to this. If I'm reading God's word and I disagree, I, have to, I must assume that I am wrong. Now think about that. If I'm reading God's word and I disagree, I must assume that I am wrong. Why is that? Well, we read about it in Psalm 19 this morning. God's word refreshes our soul. Its statutes are trustworthy. You know, this whole debate that goes on about abortion in our world right now, I don't have to wonder when life starts. I don't have to wonder about it, that at all. God made life, and he says in Psalms, I knew you in the womb. That's the end of the story. You give all the excuses you want about you know, why I, women should have the right to that because it's a part of their body. That's all hogwash. It's not true. It's false. And Christians just cannot believe it. Period. Because God is the author of life, and God made the birth process the way he made it. And when conception takes place, if you leave that fertilized egg alone, what's going to happen? One of two things. You're either going to have a, an offspring or you're going to have a spontaneous abortion. That's the end of the story. Why? Because that's where God tells us to go in Scripture. So, you see, 
when Jesus says, he who has ears to let him hear, he says, he's telling you and me, I've written you something here that's valuable. It's valuable for the sustaining of your spirit, for the refreshing of your soul, for statutes that give you direction. Read the book of Hebrews. The let us passages in the book of Hebrews. The scholars call it a hortatory subjunctive. R read those passages that say let us. And God is saying, if you'll do this, you'll end up okay. Even if you die, you're going to be okay. It's God's word that tells us we're going to rise from the dead. And so in that context, so what if we die? It's a lot, going to be a lot better shape than I'm in right now, I'll tell you that much. Proverbs chapter 2 says that the Bible, God's word, gives us wisdom and insight and understanding. It teaches us to be right and just and defines for us what rightness and justice is. And the Bible gives us the word of God, which gives us discretion. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when Israel is about to enter into the promised land, I got a new Bible and I think I bought the wrong one because this print has gotten smaller. <laughs> so Israel's about to enter into their new homeland. And here's what he tells them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Now listen to this. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. I think you could justify a tattoo there. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I have a tattoo here that says, what would Jesus do? You remember with the fish on my shoulder? I think we all ought to put one on our foreheads. When you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, what would Jesus do? Wouldn't that be a good reminder? Now, some of you are just reacting to the tattoo part, but I'm telling you, it would work. Next time you went somewhere you shouldn't and looked in the mirror, what would Jesus do? Well, I think he might leave. Because okay. you'd have to go like this to stay. And then everybody would think something was wrong with you. I remember when the boys and I, when the boys were little, we used to camp, uh, go camping in the summertime up at uh, Sam Rayburn. Do you remember David getting in the boat and praying when we'd get out in a cove? I didn't always do that real well with my kids. So I got to mention the things I did well so you'd think a little better of me relative to raising them. Think back to the people that talk to you about Scripture. Do you remember any of your Sunday school teachers when you were growing up? The one I remember is Lucille Zuber. I'm checking. Time. I was sitting in a Bible class one time when I was in junior high, and Dr. Scow, who was one of our members there, he was the, the, the Colfax County vet, northern New Mexico. And he was talk, talking to us about, whether, about what it would be like to go to hell. And I said, Dr. Scow? Well, actually, we were at church, so I called him Brother Scow at church, because back then you called everybody brother and sister. I said, Brother Scow, wouldn't, wouldn't you get used to hell after a while? 
I mean, yeah, that's it. Don't you think? You might. So he, we had a Dearborn heater sitting right there. And there was a box of matches sitting close by, and he went, he got over, and he, you remember Dearborn heaters? And he struck that match, and he held it over there, and he said, put your finger over that and get used to it. As soon as you do, I'll get you another one to keep trying. <laughs> Who are the people that you remember that said things or taught things or... I remember we had a man there at church in Rattome. He He's dead and gone now. His name was Cecil Morrow. And we found, or the, brother, the brothers at church found out that he had been, we had a racetrack in town, and he was, they found out he was a bookie at the racetrack. My sister and I liked him because he used to pay us to do his month of church cleaning at the church building. He had given us $25 to clean the church every week for a month. So we liked Brother Morrow. We were both mercenaries. And the church withdrew fellowship from him because he wouldn't quit making book at the racetrack. So that morning, one Sunday morning, I was with my grandpa and grandma. He was preaching down in Maxwell, just a little town south of Raton, a little ways. And on the way back home, I was sitting in the back seat. And I said, Grandpa, weren't we pretty mean to Brother Morrow last Sunday? And Grandpa reached into his pocket and pulled out his little Bible, little pocket Bible, and he held it, he reached back over the seat, and he said, read 2 Thessalonians 3.14. And I read the passage. And Grandpa didn't say anything else because that was God's word. The Bible says that this word that God gave us is sharper than any double-edged sword. It judges between the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Do you know that's true? Have you ever been reading, just reading the Bible and you come across something that just cuts you to the quick? Like the passage this morning during our giving about if you give to the Lord, he'll give you more, shaken down, pressed together, running over. If you look at that context there, he's talking about judging other people too, also. And God is saying, let me tell you something about judgment. If you don't give any, I won't give you any. But if you give a lot, I'll give you a lot right back. See, that's God's word. And so the Bible is, has this power to walk into our lives and just tear us apart until we tear, turn and because we have this tension and sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have us and God's word says either do this or do that. And God's word says don't go to the right or to the left. Just list, God said just listen to what I say. And that's why we have to be so careful when we, when we read God's word that we only hear what God says. You know one of the great stumbling blocks to hearing God's word? Excuse me. <laughs> <clears throat> you know one of the great stumbling blocks to hearing God's word? Church traditions. We get so tied up in how we do things that we think the doing of something, like communion this morning. Uh, uh, you were talking about how it can become a habit where you... Every Sunday we take the bread and we take the cup and we do it in a certain order. We do it in a certain way. Have you ever caught... And you give me a nod, yes or no, on this, just to loosen you up just a little bit. Have you ever caught yourself having taken communion and realized you were thinking about something completely different when you get through, like whether or not the Cowboys are actually going to win another game? Have you ever done that? Or what I'm having for supper or whether or not her roast is burning? Notice I said her roast, proper place of women in the home. 
make the roast. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Well, if they're unseen, then how do we know anything about them? Because of God's word. God says in his scripture, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we look at repentance and confession as some sort of terrible thing. It's the biggest relief that we've ever had in our lives. I get to walk before God and say, hey, I'm changing my mind. And I confess Jesus is Lord, and I'm happy to confess my sins. You know why? Because it takes a ton of bricks. Max Lucado in one of his books says, every time you sin, it's like throwing a rock in a gunny sack. And pretty soon it's dragging you to the ground because it's too heavy to bear. And God walks in, and the good news is, God's word says, God so loved the world that he gave his own begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Have what? Everlasting life. What good news is that? If we hear his word. God walks into our lives and we feel the tension between what we want and what we think and what our knowledge is and what our wisdom is or what our wisdom tells us. And God says, if you'll just make your pancakes in a stainless steel bowl, then you can transport them in Tupperware. But another way won't work. And Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have us. But because of God, we can master it. That's his call to us while we stand and sing.